Good afternoon. My name is Mona Yakubian. I'm the Vice President for the Middle East and North Africa here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon uh, to our discussion on developments in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. It is our great pleasure and honor to welcome His Excellency Rebar Ahmed, the KRG's Minister of Interior, who is visiting Washington. I want to extend a warm welcome to you, Minister Ahmed. We're very honored to have you with us and very much look forward to your insights on developments in the KRG, in Iraq, and more broadly in the region. I also want to take this moment to extend a very warm welcome uh, to uh, the Kurdistan Regional Government Representative to the U.S., Bayan Sami Ab Abdul Rahman. Thank you so much for our longstanding partnership, for your cooperation uh, with USIP. Let me also, and in particular, ex express our gratitude to the American University of Kurdistan, with whom we are co-hosting today's event. We've had the great pleasure of partnering with the AUK on a number of events, including a key conference that addressed the issues of security and climate change. This was part of the Middle East Peace and Security Forum, which was held in Dohuk earlier this year. A special thanks to Dr. Honar Isa, the Secretary of the Board of Trustees at AUK, whose efforts have made this collaboration possible. Let me just take a moment to speak briefly about USIP's work in Iraq. This year marks the 20th anniversary of USIP's work in Iraq. It is, I believe, the longest continuous presence we've had in any country globally. Our partnership with the government of Iraq, the Kurdistan regional government, and the Iraqi people has not only helped mitigate conflict and build peace in Iraq, but it has enabled sharing analysis and lessons to inform policy and policy making both in Iraq and here in Washington. And it is in that light that I think we are particularly grateful for today's discussion. This event really underscores the power of the partnerships that USIP has, both for our work on the ground and in enhancing our understanding here in Washington of developments in this complex region. After brief welcoming remarks from Dr. Isa uh, and Representative Abdurrahman, USIP's Director of Middle East Programs, Sarhang Hama Saeed, will moderate a discussion with Minister Ahmed. With that, I'm delighted to hand it over and welcome to the podium Dr. Isa, uh, who has, as I said, served as the Secretary of the Board of Trustees of AUK since 19, sorry, <laughs> since 2017, not that long. Dr. Isa, welcome. Stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mona. Uh, Your Excellency, Minister uh, Reba Rahmat, uh, esteemed diplomats, scholars, distinguished guests. I extend a warm welcome on behalf of the Middle East Peace and Security Forum um, and, um, and the American University of Kurdistan. Today we gather here in Washington, D.C. for our AUK USIP event, and it is an honor to have you all, us, to have you all with us. Uh, the MEPS Forum, hosted by the American University of Kurdistan, serves as a vital platform for fostering dialogue and collaboration among academics, intellectuals, and decision makers. Through inclusive discussions and academic research, our aim is to promote understanding, uh, resolve conflicts, and enabling uh, stability, enabling enhancing stability in the Middle East. We encourage innovative ideas and initiatives that will contribute to achieving lasting peace and security in the region. Today's event, is one of several initiatives leading up to our annual MAPS Forum, where we will delve into topics such as peace, security, climate change, and reform in Kurdistan region of Iraq. I would also like to express my gratitude to His Excellency Minister Rebar Ahmad for accepting our invitation to participate in our panel discussion. 
I would also like to extend a heartfelt thank you to the U.S. Institute of Peace, particularly Ms. Mona and Kai Sarhang and Yomna, for their, un uh, for their unwavering dedication to our partnership. Additionally, I want to acknowledge the continuous support of KRG representative Ms. Bayan Sami and her incredible team, as well as the generous backing of the AUK Foundation, who have been instrumental in supporting the Middle East Peace and Security Forum since its, since it, its inception in 2019. Lastly, I would like to express my appreciation to each, uh, each and every one of you for your presence and active participation. I hope that you will find today's conversation with His Excellency, Mr. Minister uh, uh, of the Interior, enlightening and engaging. Uh, now I would like to ask uh, Ms. Bayan Sami Abdurrahman to deliver a few words from the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us here at this auspicious occasion, and also those of you who are joining us virtually. I believe we have a very large audience online. It's a great honor to have His Excellency Minister Reber Ahmad here in Washington, DC. Uh, as you all know, he is the Minister for our Homeland Security. Uh, his ministry deals with border protection, policing, the well-being of refugees and IDPs, uh, countering drug trafficking, uh, uh, terrorism financing. So this gentleman has enormous responsibilities. And we in Kurdistan are extremely confident in his leadership, and we're delighted that he is here in Washington this week. I would like to extend our thanks to Ms. Lisa Grande, the president of USIP, Muna Yakubyan, thank you very much, and of course, Kaksarhang Hamasaid. I have been here in Washington for eight years, and USIP was one of the first institutes to welcome me here. And I'm delighted that our partnership has continued and has strengthened over that time. USIP plays a critical role in extending peace, dialogue, and reconciliation. And as I remarked earlier on today, it's an institution in Washington that does not suffer Iraq fatigue. And I think we should all be grateful for that, and we should all appreciate USIP's leadership in this field. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Hunar Issa and uh, the American University of Kurdistan. The American University of Kurdistan is one of the trailblazers in higher education in Kurdistan and Iraq. And there is no better champion for the university than Dr. Hunar Issa. I'm delighted to be here today at this joint event between USIP and the American University of Kurdistan and to welcome again His Excellency to Washington. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ben Rahman. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarang Hamasaid, the Director of Middle East Programs here at USIP. I have the pleasure and honor to be on stage with His Excellency uh, Minister Reber Ahmed, uh, and uh, I would like to also express my appreciation for the partnership between USIP and the KRG over the years on projects of conflict resolution and peace building, and for the partnership of uh, the KRG representative office here in Washington and the American University of Kurdistan. So thank you, uh, Kak and thank you, Bayan Khan. Uh, so for, our, for those who are joining us here uh, and those who are watching online, uh, we will be delving directly into questions. I'll start with some questions to the minister, and then we will welcome your questions here the, through uh, question cards and those who are watching us online uh, through uh, the chat uh, box on the USIP website under the event page uh, to send your questions uh, that way. And uh, or tag us on Twitter with the hashtag uh, uh, Reber Ahmed uh, at USIP, as you can see on the screen. Uh, for those who are here, uh, we would like to make this an interactive discussion as much as uh, possible. So in terms of uh, the, obviously there are 
three domains that we can uh, think of for this discussion, Your Excellency. Um, uh, the, uh, what developments inside the Kurdistan region, developments uh, in Iraq, developments in the Middle East, and developments uh, at the global stage. And obviously, there are probably four or five categories of themes we can talk to, such uh, as democracy and governance, uh, security, economic reforms, and uh, climate change, uh, regional dynamics, and global dynamics, in addition to then the role and the partnership with the United States between the Kurdistan region and the United States, the KRG and the United States. So hopefully, we will be able to cover as much ground. And I cannot think uh, of a better person from the Kurdistan region, really, at this particular moment, to come and talk to us about the security dynamics, his, uh, his Excellency is the heart of the uh, security and the political uh, dynamics, and he was one of the top contenders for becoming the president of Iraq, so he, ha he is in the thick of the dynamics. Uh, Your Excellency, welcome again. Uh, if we can start with a big picture uh, question. Uh, this year marks 20 years uh, since the fall of Saddam Hussein and Iraq's efforts to transition towards democracy. Uh, so in that, and then we are now about seven months into the most, recent, the most recent government that has been formed as a result of the 2021 uh, elections. Uh, so if we look at democracy and governance, from your perspective, where do you assess uh, Iraq's democracy and governance to be uh, after 20 years and seven months into the Sudani government? Well, thank you very much. First of all, I am so privileged to be here and thank you very much for USIP and the American University of Kurdistan to invite me to this uh, important events and this, uh, to be among our friends in Washington. Uh, I am so grateful to be here and thank you very much for all of our friends who are here uh, attending the, uh, this interview. Regarding the, the democracy and progress in our country in Iraq, uh, everybody knows about the change happened after 2003. And uh, we passed a very good uh, constitution and everybody accepted that constitution. At least the more than 80% of Iraqi people voted for this uh, new constitution. So I, we believe in Kurdistan that it's a very good initiative to have a new democracy in the region and uh, should be an example to the Middle East. Uh, if you look uh, to the last two decades, uh, just to uh, following the process regarding the implementation of the Constitution and how we run the country together with our partners in Baghdad, I believe it's a, a new process and uh, maybe it will take more time to understand the change because uh, Iraq is not uh, uh, contain just one sect or nation or religion. Iraq is uh, uh, containing different components, which is the Arabs, Kurds, Christian, Yazidis, Turkoman, different components, and Shia and Sunni are part of the process. So uh, to look at the history of Iraq, it's not easy to turn just uh, by changing the regime from a dictatorial ship to a democracy and a democratic ship. It means that we have to change the mentality of the decision makers, even the, the population itself, because uh, within the uh, new mentality and uh, to give up that centralism of thinking it's the main way to accept each other and to accept the change happened after 2003. Uh, unfortunately, we are suffering from unimplementing the uh, Constitution. Regarding the uh, problems between Erbil and Baghdad, uh, they are highlighted in uh, Constitution within the Article 140, the disputed area. Had, uh, nothing had been achieved on the ground. Uh, on the other hand, in daily basis, we are uh, receiving some pressure in around Kirkuk province itself that some chauvinist peoples who are trying to repeat the same policy and the same process against 
uh, more specifically against the Kurds and Turkmen around the city. So we are facing more pressure in different uh, issues. Uh, in that, uh, within the Peshmerga, there is no support from the federal government to our forces. Still, we are suffering because there is no good equipment to Peshmerga, no training, no um, releasing salaries. Even the budgets as are, are one of the main uh, problems between Erbil and Baghdad. But when it comes to the democracy and the process itself, we are very frequently, we are holding our elections in Baghdad. And there is change, changing the, the cabinets in different occasions. But the problem is, what can those cabinet achieve? And where is the stability? Where is the prosperity of the country? With all of those large numbers of revenue and the financial support and with that uh, biggest budget in the country, no services still taking place in, in different provinces in Iraq. Uh, accepting our region in Kurdistan. So the progress had been made in our region within our, uh, that small portion of budget which came from Baghdad and according to our ability uh, with our selling the gas and oil, we did a very good job in our region and we tried to transfer our experience from our province to other part of Iraq, and we are totally supporting the democracy and the, um, delivering services to other part of Iraq. And regarding the new cabinet in Baghdad, as you know, uh, it formed after a struggle between all the partners in Baghdad. We will part of this and still we are supporting the new cabinet after we signed a new agreement between all the partners regarding the political uh, agreement and even the uh, cabinet program which passed by the parliament. Um, we are somehow optimistic to the future that uh, the new prime minister will uh, be able to implement uh, the political agreement and uh, implementing the constitution itself because some of the political agreement and the cabinet program is linked to this constitution. For example, still uh, the federalism is not uh, implemented in, in Iraq. Only we have just uh, Kurdistan region as a federal uh, region. So we have to have a new uh, assembly, which is the federal assembly, which is uh, mentioned inside the constitution. So inside the uh, political agreement, there is uh, an article that within the six month, we have to have some new laws. One of them is the hydrocarbon laws, and the other is to uh, amend the federal court laws and uh, the third one, and the most important, is the Federal Assembly, which uh, till now nothing had been achieved. However, we, together with our partner in Baghdad, we worked uh, on a draft regarding the hydrocarbon law, but unfortunately nothing had been achieved because of the competition inside the parliament within the new law of budget. So uh, we are... Uh, very supportive, and we are very close to the Prime Minister in Baghdad, uh, the relation between our uh, cabinet with the federal government uh, is so good, and the Prime Minister himself, uh, His Excellency Masrur Barzani, is very supportive and support the uh, Prime Minister in Baghdad uh, to let him act as a Prime Minister for everybody in Iran. And uh, we believe that uh, this new prime minister, he has that ability if others will let him to act as a prime minister for everyone. So uh, I would like to uh, ask my uh, next question and exactly where you, where you uh, ended. 
uh, with Prime Minister Abadi, with Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi, with Prime Minister uh, Kalvami, they all had positive relations with the Kurdistan region. But then it is the broader political uh, um, uh, actors that then in parliament, outside parliament, then the, the, the direction changes. Uh, so in looking at the budget experience, looking at the, uh, at the uh, uh, conversations about the, the hydrocarbon law uh, or the energy law or the oil and gas law, um, many people in Iraq use the term last opportunity. This was the, last, the government of the last opportunity because for the past 20 years, uh, yes, there has been progress, new constitution, as you mentioned, elections, but you also mentioned some of the challenges that made governance difficult. Uh, go Iraq is a diverse country, as you mentioned, governing in that diversity has been difficult. So when the Iraqis talk about this is the last opportunity, what, and the leadership talk about this, what do they mean this is the last opportunity, and what could be done so that this does not become the last opportunity and the political agreement actually is implemented? Well, I don't like to say that it will be the last opportunity. Uh, but uh, I would like to say that uh, we are facing the same problem, uh, but in different time and in different shape. Why someone is calling and telling this process that uh, it will be a last opportunity because we are signing good agreement. We provide a good constitution. And there's all participating in this cabinet. Shia with different, uh, except the uh, Al-Sadr, with different blocks, Sunni with different blocks, Kurds with different uh, representatives. We are our representatives in this cabinet. So if all of us together we will not be able to implement the political agreement and the cabinet program. So what will be the result? The fall of the state and the chaos in the, in the country. So therefore, someone are trying to, to tell that and to making pressure that this will be the last opportunity. Otherwise, we lost uh, many opportunities. And I believe there is good opportunity within all of threats and challenges. There is vacuum for opportunities. If, as I mentioned, if all of partners will support the, pres the, the prime minister in this position and in, in this very specific time, I believe there is a good opportunity for successful. But otherwise, we will repeat the same mistakes and we will have the same problem, but maybe in different shape. Maybe another chaos in the country, but uh, for how long? the Iraqi citizens, the Iraqi poor people will uh, accept all of this chaos and support the politi politicians. Election after elections, uh, early election, and sometimes mm, changing the prime ministers in, in, in between two elections. So we used to have every kind of experience. People need more services, more stability, and dignity. So. Just look at the last election. People were not participating in that uh, uh, large numbers. And the, the participation was not uh, so helpful. So it will, it, if the situation will be like this, no delivering services, no hopes to the future, and the loyalty to the country will not be on that level that protect the security and the safety of people. So it will be last opportunity ended. But again, I am, I, I am, I am talking about the, the future and I am talking about the prime minister who is on, on this position. He is a reliable prime minister. So therefore we are continuously supporting the prime minister on his effort to implement the agreement and somehow in different way to try to implement the constitu constitution itself because we all gave him six months with all of these problems. Maybe there will be another six months, but 
it will not be to the end. Right. So we are looking forward what will be the achievement of the cabinet where supported by everybody. But again, there is a lot of pressure on the prime minister in different sides and trying to stop him to be a prime minister for everybody. Oh, thank you. Uh, definitely, I think um, uh, that sense of optimistic uh, um, uh, optimism about the prime minister and uh, his cabinet uh, is something that I have uh, uh, seen and witnessed uh, when I visited uh, uh, Baghdad a couple of times uh, this year and um, uh, it, it's at the level of the people that you see that growing so hopefully the government, uh, his government will be able, now it has a strong parliamentary backing so there is an opportunity for legislation to look at the lessons of the past 20 years and try to prevent some of those challenges. So uh, Your Excellency, if I might sh shift gears and focus on the Kurdistan region, the journey of the Kurdistan region uh, on democracy started earlier, in 1992, when the KRG was formed, uh, elections after the, uh, the, uh, the uprisings. Where do you assess the democracy and government in the Kurdistan region? Especially, as you know, there are areas of progress, but also um, there are areas where most recently people got concerned about some of the internal Kurdish dynamics. Uh, what is your assessment? Well, as you mentioned, we started our democracy much earlier than Baghdad. We started after 1991, after the uprising of our people in Kurdistan. Uh, and uh, we started to have election, to have uh, our parliament, to have our government. And it wasn't easy for us to uh, have that kind of progress regarding the democracy. Again, we are part of the Middle East and uh, there is a lot of pressures and intra-conflict uh, in between our communities. Uh, and because of uh, uh, the sensitivity of the Kurdish issue in the Middle East, uh, we are receiving more pressure in, in, in different sides. But thanks, Kat, and thanks our people, and th thanks again to our political parties, uh, we, are, we passed that hard time uh, to facing each other. But uh, the now, nowadays, the more competition between the political parties is to have a new election in our region. So I believe within the new election to be held in our region, the future will be much better than now. And all of this, that, those problems will be solved to have a new election. And I'm asking for uh, all of the political parties to support uh, the effort in Kurdistan to, uh, as soon as possible, to determine a new uh, date of the election and to have a new election very early on. So in, uh, on elections, there are talks about two elections in Iraq, one uh, for the Kurdistan region uh, parliament and, the, and out of which will come a new government, but also talk about provincial elections uh, in Iraq. So uh, now you, you're saying that there, an, a date has not been set for the Kurdistan regional government that is being worked on, but is there a date for the provincial elections in Iraq? Yes, the provincial election is in Iraq is uh, uh, determined in November. Okay. But uh, our election is supposed to be in November too. But because of that, problems happened uh, inside the parliament. Where some were not so happy within the progress with the uh, forward to have a new election, uh, somehow it had been uh, postponed, it, uh, and there is no any new uh, exact time for have a, a new election, and they complicated the, the situation within the new decision by the federal court in Baghdad. Again, uh, nothing will stop us in Kurdistan to have a new election, because we have no alternative without to go back to the people and ask them who will be able to run the country better than before. So we are ready to have an election. The Prime Minister himself, the Prime, um, His Excellency Masrur Barzani, he is very strongly pushed forward to have a new election. And uh, we are ready now, but it's somehow the, the high commission of the election in Erbil or in Baghdad, who will be able to run this new election? This is the question. Otherwise, 
we have no any alternative for not having an election, even if it will happen this year or the next year. We should have an election, and we have to accept the results. So people will determine and decide who will be the majority and minority inside the parliament. We are respecting the uh, decisions by the people. But provincial elections, it, it belongs to Iraq. We are not participating as a region. We have our own law for the, our for the province election in our region. So we hope that the, that, that election will be succeed and uh, will be held in, in the same, same time. However, there's some uh, problems on the way because the High Commission of Election in Baghdad, maybe for the next month, will not be there anymore. So I believe there is a lot of uh, problems and uh, obstacles in, on the way to have that uh, election even in Iraq. Okay. Yeah, I mean, even my visits, I, uh, I've been hearing that it, that it may be pushed to, to early next year because the preparations may not be uh, ready. So if I may just follow up, uh, I mean, the Kurdistan regional government, and you made some references to it, that takes pride in uh, starting elections and embarking on a journey of democracy before Iraq started in 2003, and there are achievements that the KRG leadership uh, point to with pride. Uh, but in recent years, uh, there has also been some criticism directed at the Kurdistan regional government for uh, uh, some areas of human rights and some areas of uh, freedom of expression. How would you uh, respond to those criticisms? Well, first of all, there is no any perfect uh, area regarding the human rights and the democracy even globally. Mm -hmm. But we started within the new cabinet when the Prime Minister, Masrur Barzani, started the new cabinet. He dedicated and committed to the democracy and to the human rights protection and to provide better situation and environment for the freedom of express. And this is our program and this is our strategy. And his Excellency is committed, and everybody inside the cabinet is committed to protect better human rights and provide that situation for the freedom of express. But there have to be um, a reality, and we have to look at the reality on the ground. Maybe uh, someone are talking some about some issues where it's not the reality. They just uh, allocated uh, some points uh, just to show that there are some concerns. Even if there are some concerns, we as government, we are very open to tackle these issues if there are some wrong issues and some policies are running in some districts or some province it's not our strategy as a, as a cabinet, and totally we are op uh, opposite to this uh, uh, process. And the Prime Minister is ordering everybody, especially the Minister of Interior, to follow all of these issues. And uh, we are open to any kind of uh, negotiation, exchanging views with our partners, and locals, and the international partners, to tackling this issue, and even I am asking our partner here in Washington that maybe we need in, in, in different areas more training and more support because we have to take benefit from other experience, uh, very specifically in Washington and from our friends in the United States. So we are very open to tackle every single point there uh, which is a concern by anyone if it's uh, locally or, or from our friends in inter uh, internationally. Um, again, I am uh, repeating that uh, our commitment and dedicated to the democracy and the human rights. And just to, if, if to look at, at the media in our region, you can find everything. Everyone has the right to talk about everything, politically, socially, economically, they are tackling everything. They are talking about everyone. 
And no one inside the cabinet are targeting any one of those who are talking about their political issues. And we are very proudly, we don't have anyone in jail regarding their political views. So this is the situation in our region. Again, uh, we are open to any kind of uh, cooperation, coordination, receiving consultants and uh, cooperating with our friends. But I believe we are providing one of the best environment for everybody in our region. Just an example for that, that we are hosting about one million refugees and IDPs from different areas of Iraq and different countries around the region. And the majority of refugees are living in our country, in our region. And those people who were suffered when ISIS came and still who are suffering any kind of pressure in different provinces in Baghdad, in south of Iraq, in different provinces in Iraq, the only area to think about and to live in peace and secure and dignity is our region. We are providing that environment for everybody in our region. So how will be the case for our citizens in, who are originated in our region? Therefore, we are very proud of that, of coexistence and accepting each, each other. I believe that democracy started from to accept the differences. We are very proud of this point. We don't care who is belong to what religion who is belong to what ethnic group or sect. You can find out in, in every single city in our region that everybody is living in a peace, which is one of your main goals as an USIP. So we are so pro proud for this process and this coexistence. As I mentioned for our, our friends that it's not just for media or the, for politics. These are values we believe in. If the international community will support or not, we as a community, we grow up with this culture. We grow up with the values to accept each other. Therefore, the less number of fundamentalists in our region affiliated with ISIS, even at the the top time of the ISIS, we're controlling every area in, in, in Sunni uh, province. So this is that values. I always ask my, uh, our, our friends that it's not just our duty to protect these values, to protect this region. I believe it's the international community responsibility to protect Kurdistan within these values. At least we have this small region in Middle East that accept everyone without asking who, who are you and where are you come from. Just to give you a small example why we are accepting each other and why it's, it becomes a value. In my small village in Barzan, there were mosque, church, and knist. These different religious and these different temples were in a small village. And the distance between all of these temples was just meters. So this be, was a culture in, in my small village. And it expanded to all of the region. All of our people believing in coexistence. Therefore, they opened the gate, first of all, the, their heart, and then the, the gate to all of the people who were in need in Iraq and even in Syria. This is the situation. Therefore, we are committed to the democracy, to the human rights, to the freedom of express. And this is our culture. Thank you. I think that's uh, one of the welcome uh, uh, elements that I have seen in Erbil and also now you are reiterating is that uh, with KRG welcoming to 
collaborate, work on improving things, even where uh, uh, where things may not be at the desired um, objective level. So that's that's a welcome. And so I have a question on some of the things you said from the audience. Um, you talked about uh, internally displaced persons, and uh, for for context, uh, the fight against ISIS displaced about 6 million people, and the Kurdistan re region received uh, close to, I think at some point, 2 million people between uh, the Iraqi uh, displaced persons and Syrian refugees. So the one question uh, from the audience is, what is the current KRG plan um, to immerse uh, internally displaced persons like Yazidis, Turkmen, and others uh, into local communities? Somehow integrated them? Yeah. Well, our strategy regarding the displaced people, IDPs who are living in our region, more specifically the Yazidis and Christian, we are supporting the strategy to ret return those people to their areas of origin, voluntary and in dignity. And we believe that the integration with our local people is not the right way. Because it creates a vacuum in Nineveh Plain, in Sinjar, and indirectly there will be a demographic change, which is totally we are against the, any kind of demographic change. We've suffered for that demographic change for the last decades when the dictatorship were ruling Baghdad, they started an Arabization process in different area. And we believe that the implementation of Article 140 will be the main roadway to give more opportunity to those people who are living in this area. And Turkmen, Christian, Yazidis, are from this area. It's not the fair way to integrate them in other areas. Yeah. It's the wrong, po we believe it's a wrong policy. We have to provide a security, safety, services, and hopes to these people to go back to their homeland. This is the right way. Therefore, we signed an agreement as you know, with the federal government regarding the normalizing situation in Sanjar. Mm -hmm. And uh, the aim of the agreement is to convince Yazidis to go back to their homeland. Otherwise, who will fill the gap? A large number of Yazidis are living in our camps and in between our cities, more than 350,000. Still, they are in, in, in the camps, in, in everywhere. But if you ask, are you are agree on the situation inside the camps? Totally not, because it's not the, the best way. But they are preferring to stay in camps, not to go back to their homeland. And there is many of factors. But totally, we in KRG are opposing this idea that integrating people Turkmen, Christian, Yazidis, they are welcome in our region for long term. But to integrate them, so what will be the alternative for the homeland, for the disputed area? Right. It, will, it will make a disaster for this area. Therefore, it's not the right policy. Clear. So I, uh, before I move to ask you about security, uh, we have another question from the, uh, uh, from the audience, from Julia. I think it relates to some of the things we talked about, elections. And so the, uh, the question is, does the gender quota system in place in the KRG encourage the inclusion of more women in the government? Yes, exactly. And uh, we hope that uh, we will reach a point that without quota, the women will be that large number represented in the um, in institutions like uh, parliaments, like governments, like uh, inside the um, political parties, leadership. And uh, there's a good progress regarding this issue. Uh, 
large number of women, they win the elections, even for the Iraqi parliament and for our parliament in Kurdistan without quota. And they were gaining more votes and more than men. So there's a very good progress regarding the women rule inside the institutions. And by the way, uh, the prime minister is uh, very supportive in this regard. In this cabinet, we have three uh, women ministers. And uh, in different uh, uh, positions, when there will be a replaced by a new uh, members, we are insisting to have a woman. And uh, I am the head of the committee to implement the UN Security Council resolution 1325. So we are working very closely with the High Council of the Women and Development. Uh, we have inside our ministry a very active general director which is dealing with the violence against women and children, and we passed a very good law in our parliament to protect the, the women from any kind of violence. And we just tried recently to have uh, a new bill of the law to modify the, 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 the recent law to the better condition, to provide better condition for women inside the workplace. So I believe there is a huge effort is going on in our region regarding the uh, women uh, participating in ruling the region and being a leadership. Thank you. So if I may uh, transition to security, as uh, Representative Rahman um, talked about, um, yeah, that part of your portfolio is homeland security. It has several components. Um, so. Iraq, the Kurdistan region, has dealt with the threat of Al-Qaeda, threat of ISIS. Uh, you have the, um, uh, the PKK, you have uh, uh, Turkish operations, you have Iranian uh, operations. As minister, what are, how, do you, how do you assess the biggest threats to the Kurdistan region right now? And uh, what help or assistance are you getting from Baghdad and the United States to deal with them? Well, we are living in a very complicated uh, geography. And uh, we are receiving multi-pressures. Yes, as you mentioned, uh, PKK is one of the challenges. And again, PKK is one of the main challenges in Sanjar. And the main restriction on the way to implementing the agreement, because there are controlling many facilities inside the district and they are not helpful to leave to let people to go back. ISIS still is one of the main threats to, the, to Iraq and to the region in, in the Middle East, not just in Iraq and uh, even to our region. Uh, unfortunately still there is a big gap between uh, Peshmerga forces within the Iraqi security forces uh, uh, still, there is two front lines who are facing each other in different areas. But uh, there is good uh, understanding uh, between Baghdad and Erbil to have uh, joint operations and uh, to create, to have esta to establish a joint brigades. There is good effort to, uh, after the uh, new budget, to pay salaries for those two brigades, uh, and it takes a lot of time. So uh, regarding the uh, militias who are uh, threatening the situation and the security in Iraq in general, and especially in disputed area, again, it's one of the main uh, threats and challenge. And in general, in Iraq, in, in, in the Middle East, uh, even in the, in the world, the drone attacks became one of the main threats to everybody. So we had our share in, in, in this regard. So we are uh, seeking how to protect our region within the, this kind of threats. Uh, therefore, the, uh, 
that support coming from the United States to the Peshmerga forces is crucial. And uh, it started when the ISIS came and till now they are involving in reform with our Peshmerga forces and financially supporting the Peshmerga. It's very important to continue and to have a unified Peshmerga forces. It's one of the main goals by, the, by His Excellency Prime Minister. He started a very good initiative with the reform inside Peshmerga. And nowadays, we are in, in a very good position regarding the reform. The, it has been achieved a, a, a lot within the MOU signed by our government, with the United States government. So we are very optimistic regarding the unification of Peshmerga forces. And I believe uh, within our security and intelligence services, within our police forces, we will be able to face all of this challenge. Of course, within the cooperation by, uh, with the Iraqi federal government and again, getting support with the, by the uh, coalition forces who are still in the region fighting against terrorist group. So if I may uh, follow up on the assistance and relationship with the United States, and the relationship historically moved from protection when Saddam was in power, there was attack, the no-fly zones, to uh, uh, assistance to rebuild the region, to partnership in the fight against Saddam, where the Northern Front to remove Saddam was established, and then in the fight against ISIS. Today and looking into the future, where do you see the areas of collaboration, partnership between the Kurdistan region and the United States? Well, as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> the, there is a lot of challenge in, in, the, in the region. Uh, we believe that uh, we in Iraq in general and more specifically in Kurdistan, we're still in need to have uh, United States as a partner, as a main partner to support our security and our Peshmerga forces, even the Iraqi military forces, to stand up with uh, and to face all of that challenge. Because believe me, uh, we be able together to defeat ISIS militarily. But uh, still, there is a high potential for this group to reorganize themselves. And even they are uh, targeting Peshmerga forces, Iraqi security forces, and uh, the main part of the fundamentalist organization is the ideology itself. So we have to work together very closely with Iraqi federal governments, with the United States, and even with other partners, international partners, to face these fundamentalist people because the ideology is not, not being tackled by, by anyone. It will take more time, maybe decades, to uh, normalize the situation. I always said that to win the, the war, it's much easier than to build a peace. So now we are in, in the, in the post-war position. We have to continue the mission and to finish the mission and to try to build that peace in, in our country, in around the region, because otherwise any kind of fail will be disaster to all of that effort and those sacrificed, those people who sacrificed to provide this situation for everybody in Iraq. So thank you. If I may combine a question from the audience about climate change in the Kurdistan region, and it's my understanding that's an, another area, especially under the Biden administration, where Iraq and the Kurdistan region are focusing on. Can, what, what can you tell us about cooperation on climate change, and how do you see the uh, challenge of climate change in the Kurdistan region? Well, uh, we in Iraq in general and in Kurdistan, we are suffering from the climate change. Uh, and more specifically, we are facing, uh, in winter, we are facing floods in different areas, and in summer, lack of water resources. So both axles are acting in our region. And uh, to talk about the uh, other part of Iraq, there is lack of re water resources in south of Iraq, and it will be Iraq will be one of the main countries who will suffer from the climate change, naturally, but again, 
with our neighbors, we are facing some challenges. They are stopping flow of waters to the uh, supply rivers to the Tiger and uh, Euphrat and Tigers. So Iraq will be uh, one of the main countries, and uh, I believe for the next years, uh, we in Kurdistan we will face that uh, wave of displaced people mm. because of the climate change in south of Iraq. And within the Kurdistan itself, uh, specifically in Erbil, if you look at the level of the groundwater, it went more deep yeah. before. If a if couple of years it was from 200 meters, now it becomes 600 to 700 meters. So we tackle this issue, and the Prime Minister, Masrur Barzani, is very uh, taking care about the climate change in Kurdistan. And uh, we started to have more reservation of water resources, and we started to build that small ponds that provide uh, rainfall from the winter for the agricultural issues and even for the water ground t uh, table. And we started to uh, use other resources for the energy production. The solar uh, energy is one of the film that uh, the Prime Minister is very interested in, and he started a very good initiative regarding the, to have a new projects, even with the private sector and within the uh, public service itself. So we are suffering from this, but uh, the consequence will be appear for the next years. Thank you. So I, uh, we have only a few minutes, and I have two important questions raised here. I want to make sure, so we may run a little bit, a uh, few minutes over. So I have one question, uh, two questions from uh, the audience. One is, uh, how do you deal with Iranian military threats regarding the Iranian Kurdish opposition and other issues? So that's one question. The other question is, fighting corruption was the most important slogan raised by Masrur Barzani's government. And uh, at the beginning, um, has any uh, prominent figures been prosecuted for corruption? Well, if I start from the corruption, it's one of the main fields that the prime minister started a reform. Of course, uh, everybody knows that reform has a large number of enemies. Those who will lose their interest, they will turn to an enemy for the reform. And uh, we are facing this uh, kind of pressure. But the prime minister is very committed and dedicated to continue the mission. And the main articles within the new cabinet was the reform in different sectors. He started a very good uh, initiative, and uh, everybody is, uh, of course, who are taking benefit from the reform are very interested and supportive. Uh, but there is a high commission of the uh, anti-corruption uh, High Council of Anti-Corruption in, in, in the region. They are dealing with those people who are uh, guilty and they are involved in the corruption process. And uh, the cabinet and the prime minister is supporting their effort and admitting everybody who is involved in the uh, corruption. So it's one of the main goals, but I believe it will take more time and maybe uh, for the new cabinet, the consequence and the result will be more clear for everybody what had been done from that point where the prime minister started that initiative. Regarding the uh, pressure from our neighbors and military threatened to our region, unfortunately, in different occasions, we are receiving statements in, in, in a, about this uh, threat and challenge. But uh, we believe in Iraq uh, and in Kurdistan that we can solve all of this problem by exchanging views and uh, exchanging delegations and information 
And I believe uh, there is uh, better ways to deal with this, all of these concerns, mutual concerns on the border issues between Iraq and Iran. But we are understanding what uh, the sensitivities are for, for our neighbors. We are suffering because of a lot of uh, things around the region, but uh, uh, I believe but the, the cooperation between uh, KRG and federal government regarding all of these threats and the uh, coordination with our neighbors, it will be the best way to deal with all of these threats and concerns for both sides. Thank you. So we are actually at exactly at the end of our time, but I would like to ask you about the region. One last question. Uh, I was in, um, uh, in, I think I was in Baghdad at the time when the, announce, the, the Iran-Saudi deal brokered by China was announced. Uh, you are at the heart of the Middle East, Kurdistan region, Iraq is. Uh, from your perspective, um, I heard two, two different views uh, even from the Kurdistan region. Those who believe that de-escalation in the region is good for Kurdistan, for the region and for the Kurdistan region, for the Middle East region and the Kurdistan region. Uh, but there were those who were concerned that said, actually, if the bigger powers of the region de-escalate the Kurdistan and Kurdistan region is the weakest link in the area, the Kurds are the weakest link, so therefore they may turn their attention and, and, and it may end badly for the Kurds. How do you view, uh, and the increased role of China and the impact of that um, uh, agreement? Well, Middle East historically is one of the main strategic geography for every superpowers in around the world. The competition between those superpowers through the history, it was there and it will continue. But the main part of what will affect our situation is the regional powers competition on Middle East. But we, as a small region, we are supporting any kind of normalizing situation in Middle East. And we are supporting more stability, more security, and it will conduct more prosperity and more integration between the different nations in respecting each other and respecting mutual interests in the region. Uh, I believe uh, to normalize the situation between any different countries, it should not be on other interests. So, uh, we will do our best to be able to uh, be partner, a good partner, a good supporter to the normalizing the situation and providing more safety and stability. Because within this stability, within the security, uh, we believe that uh, there will be a, uh, an economic progress and better uh, opportunities for everybody to exchange and to have better interest in the region. So I believe uh, in every single threat and challenge, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity. Well, I think that's a good positive note uh, to end on. Uh, I would like to thank you so very much uh, for taking the time to be with us. I would like to thank uh, our participants here in the, uh, in the room and those who are watching online. I appreciate uh, your time. Uh, so please join me in a round of applause for the minister for his, uh, his remarks and time. I apologize for those who asked questions. There were plenty of them, and we were short on time. I'm, I apologize that I couldn't get to all your questions, but I hope that we've covered uh, as many of them as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much.